Jeff asks uh, what it was like for her to perform her first same-sex wedding. This is her answer. It's one more example of what I see as the genius of our Constitution. If I asked you the question, who counted among we the people when our Constitution was new? Well, not very many people. Certainly I wouldn't count. Certainly not people who were held in human bondage. Not even most men, because you had to be a property owner. So think of what our nation and our Constitution would have, bec have become over now, well, more than two centuries. The idea of we the people has become more and more embraceive. People who were once left out, people who were once slaves, women, Native Americans, did not count in the beginning. Inclusiveness has come about as a result of constitutional amendments in the case of the Civil War, three post-Civil War amendments, and judicial interpretation. The idea was there from the beginning, equality. And yet you can read every page of your pocket constitution and you will not find in the original constitution the word equal or equality, even though equality was a main theme of the Declaration of Independence. The word equal becomes a part of the Constitution in the 14th Amendment, so I see as the genius of our Constitution and of our society how much more embraceive we have become than we were at the start. So if you're a con law dork, that just raises all the hairs on your arm. Like it's such an exquisite, articulation of something that is the answer, I think, to the cartoon versions of living constitutionalism. And my question is, you can answer any question you want about oh. that. Um, there's a bit at the end where you ask her about that word embraceive. But I think I want to ask you the question, she says that makes her an originalist, Jeff. Yeah. She says this is originalism. And I wondered if you could talk about that for a minute. Well, first I have to say thanks for reading that quote. And yes, it just, it does bring goosebumps. And it does sum up what a liberal vision of the Constitution would look like that was born at Seneca Falls, where uh, heroes of the women's rights movement wrote a declaration of women's rights invoking the Declaration of Independence and insisting that natural rights of liberty, of equal liberty and here in all human beings. And for her in that beautiful paragraph where every word is well chosen to have talked about how the Constitution has come to slowly embrace not only African Americans and women but then other excluded groups all fulfilling the promise of the Declaration and then to tie that back to the founding vision and to view it as a form of originalism is incredibly inspiring. And the word I asked her about is embraceive. What a beautiful, distinctive, particular word. And as I said to her, that's your word. That's not Thomas Jefferson or anyone else, embraceive. I said, what did you mean by embraceive? She means embracing, she, her reply was, embracing the left out people, not just grudgingly, but with open arms. Mm. Isn't that beautiful? It's just. And, 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 that's, and that's her vision, and it's distinctive, and that's why she's a hero. That's why there are very few Supreme Court justices. There are many good ones, there, you know, there's some great ones, but there are few who transform the meaning of the Constitution, our understanding of the Constitution. Thurgood Marshall, through his advocacy, you know, Brandeis, through re-envisioning the First Amendment, Get Justice Ginsburg, by envisioning the Constitution as a more embraceive document. Was I surprised that she called herself an originalist? I was, because I, I, I said, you know, there's originalism and what's the alternative? Because uh, you're not an originalist. And she said, no, I am. But I think the founders anticipated the Constitution becoming ever more embraceive. And it's striking. Uh, Justice uh, Kagan, uh, in introducing Justice Scalia, said, we're all originalists now in the sense that everyone thinks that the text and original understanding matters to some degree. The question is, how do you translate the Constitution in light of changes in society. And Justice Ginsburg's genius is to see that increasing embraceiveness as stemming from the founder's own vision so that the promise of the Declaration, which is thwarted in the original Constitution, resurrected by Lincoln at Gettysburg and in front of Independence Hall. And you know what we have to do for now, friends, for just a minute? The best part of this building, the reason we're here right now, let us just have the privilege of inspiring ourselves by looking over there the room where it happened, the room where the Declaration of Independence is drafted, 
promises that all men are created equal. That promise is thwarted in the Constitution. Lincoln stands in front of there in 1861 and says, I've never had a thought politically that didn't stem from the Declaration. Uh, and then the promise of the Declaration is codified in the post-Civil War amendments, which you can see downstairs. But women are betrayed and because the women's hour has not come. And the word male is inserted into the 14th Amendment for the first time. But then comes the promise of women's equality. And in 1920, in an anniversary we're going to celebrate all next year, starting in 2020, uh, women's equality. Yes, we're seeing a lot of uh, enthusiasm about that. Women are uh, granted the right to vote and the Constitution becomes more and more embracive. And Justice Ginsburg's great uh, achievement is both enshrining that promise into the Constitution in her uh, Virginia Military uh, Institute opinion, and also in challenging us to remember that the embraceiveness of equality remains uh, to be worked out, and not all imposed by judges. She remains, she's not a conventional, there's nothing conventional about this genius, this great woman. She doesn't believe that judges should just enforce equality according to what they think that, uh, you know, uh, the philosophy requires. She thinks it's ultimately up to us, and that's why she's so inspired by young women who are fighting state by state in state legislatures and in the political arena to get a more embracive vision of equality, because she says, don't rely on judges. You, you, the, 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 I dodged the question about the courts because it's such a big question, but her answer would be, don't rely on the courts. Social change has never come primarily from the courts. The courts can nudge or put on small breaks or they can codify new understandings of equality after they've been embraced by society as in the marriage equality decision or even in Brown v. Board of Education. But judges cannot lead. And that's another remarkable thing about her, this great leader who had this heroic vision of equality as an advocate is so conscious of her role as a judge, becomes more comfortable because of her newfound voice and because of her empathy, but still never mistakes it to be primarily the role of the courts to fight for equality. She thinks that's the role of all of us.